we're going to talk about the Detroit Pistons, the team James used to cover. He's never covered a playoff win for the franchise, to be perfectly honest. Neither did I during my time as a beat writer. Uh, maybe we're both the curse of the Detroit Pistons. They have not won a playoff game since May 26, 2008. Game four of the Eastern Conference Finals against the Boston Celtics. Don't ask me how I know these things because I can barely remember what I ate for dinner last night. Now you are you are Rain Man when it comes to dates and sports. I'm bad with dates and sports, but you're Rain Man for sure. Stupid. It, it is the most useless Jeopardy information. Like I can like I've it's I've gone through this stuff before. This. Yeah, it is. Like I can name all MVPs from the year that I was born. Like it, I, you did do that. I quizzed you, and I yeah, I I have quizzed you before. I maybe asked you the NBA champions or something. Oh yeah, that's you, easy. That's yeah, easy. you did rattle it off. Yeah, that that stuff is that stuff is so. I can do that in my sleep. Like literally, I could probably close my eyes and start falling asleep. And you said MVP in 1995. Like oh, Dave Robinson. You know what I mean? Like that sort of thing. Just yeah. ridiculously goofy. But but now that you're no longer with the Detroit Pistons or covering the Detroit Pistons, maybe they can get under this uh, bad shadow, right? Monty Williams gone, Troy Weaver gone, Trajan Langdon, J.B. Bickerstaff in. I would venture to say that is an upgrade from the product that we saw last year from starting the season with five centers and the Killian Hayes stuff and the 26-game losing streak and Monty Williams, like how invested is he? I feel like the a lot of the clutter is gone to some degree, but I still feel like there's other questions that remain. Yeah, for sure. I think that um what needed to happen this summer just given how kind of insane is not the right word but um uh i mean that's tough right like from a reporter like again i don't i don't care about wins and losses i care about the best stories but at a point it's like what like how many times do i have to write that they're bad like what is like you know what i mean like we get yeah, the point yeah, yeah. like it's just a lot but last year Everybody, there needed to be some type of cleanse from last year. Like, mm -hmm. no, that's not healthy for anybody, right? Um, and they do that. I think that this team is, they're my sneaky pick to make the play in. And let me explain. Please. They are the one team at the bottom of the conference. First of all, the bottom of the East is terrible. And 10 teams make the postseason. It's probably eight good teams. It depends on where you're at with Miami. Probably eight good teams. So that means there's a what is it, seven way fight for the last two. Detroit, Cade Cunningham has never had spacing. And you watched, you read every home game as well, pretty much last year. And Cade had a really good season without spacing, right? Now you add Tobias Harris, you add Malik Beasley. I know Tim Hardaway has struggled in the preseason, but you they added Simone Fontecchio at the trade deadline. Tech 19 can shoot the blood out of the ball. Um, like they have spacing around Cade for the first time in his career. Uh, I've kept an eye on them this preseason. It looks like Jaden Ivey is shooting the blood out of the ball in preseason as well, right? Yes, so he is. There are pieces there to play um, a style conducive to the centerpiece, which is Cade Cunningham. Now, to my point, let's look at the bottom of these. If you told me Detroit is better than Atlanta, are you shocked? No. Are you told me Detroit is better than Chicago, are you shocked? Slightly. Than Chicago, you think so? Yeah. Okay. I think Chicago might be better than people think. Okay, that's fair. As uh, long Detroit as Zach Levine is the, if, if, you know what I mean? Like that's that's contingent. Yeah. But go ahead, I get your point. I just think that team. I, I think they're living in the excitement of the season starting, but once you get to December twelfth and they're four and twelve, like I could see that team tapping out. You know what I mean? Just yeah, older yeah, guys that might it. not care anymore. Um, if you tell me Detroit is better than Charlotte, are you shocked? No. Uh, Toronto. No. Like and I, Washington, Detroit's better than Washington, I think. So that's all the teams, and it's like to me, you look at Detroit, and because they've lost so much over the last few years, they're the one team that can't afford to lose a lot again. Nope. And other teams can. Washington can. Charlotte can. Uh, Atlanta can. But um, well, there's no expectations in those places. There, there is right. no franchise tradition in those places. So therefore there won't be a lot of disappointment. Like in Detroit, like it's been so bad. Like I just mentioned how bad it is, but that is a legacy franchise. And when you hit, when people hear that, they don't think of that in that way, but that is a legacy franchise, especially when you consider, and when you consider 
the modern NBA, and when I say modern NBA, I mean post-playoff expansion to four rounds in 16 teams back in 1984, the year I was born. So that's a 40-year sample size. The Boston Celtics are the number one team in terms of making the conference finals in the East. You know who the number two team is over the last 40 years in the East of getting to the conference finals? Detroit. The Detroit Pistons. That's how often they've been in the hunt. Now, granted, it happened in these very big and very well-defined clusters of periods where it wasn't just, oh, a year here, a year there. And that's how you wind up adding up to, you know, 11, I think it is. Yes. But you remember those periods and they had, you know, great series against great spoils and they were, you know what I'm saying, great, great franchises at the time. So you don't think of them now in that way. But there are expectations in this city of being able to get it right because you got to give people a reason to come out in the middle of January when there's other entertainment options and the weather is cold and you yep. can sit at your crib and watch it on TV. And, and you know this, too. And I find this. So it's 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 very much a difference between Detroit and New York. Like, I feel like Knicks fans. And again, excuse me if I'm wrong. I feel like Knicks fans. It's like when you call. Like there's a bully at school and they're picking on 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 like your little brother. Like I can call my little brother fat. You can't call my little brother fat. That's mm-hmm. Knicks fans. Mm-hmm. Detroit fans love to hate their teams. You'll tweet about the Pistons losing by twenty. Like who cares? We're watching the Lions. Who cares? We're watching the Red Wings. Who cares? We're watching the Tigers or the Red Wings are struggling. Who cares? We're watching the Pit. Right? Like there's a there's a they love to hate their teams. And when the Lions are doing well and it looks like the Tigers might be on the rise and the Red Wings show some stuff last year, like I wasn't ever going to leave Detroit for a, a town that wasn't as invested in sports as Detroit. And New York is one of the very few towns that is. And that is a tough place to play Detroit because the fans have seen what winning looks like. They know what winning looks like. They are like similar to Knicks fans are tired of getting beat on nationally. Mm hmm. And they're just tired of losing and there's expectations there. Um, And I think that they have a roster capable of taking the progress that they should have taken last year. It's going to be interesting to see. I think they need to stay healthy, but Isaiah Stewart developing into a a, a solid three point shooter and and what he brings defensively looks like Jalen Duran has shown a couple flashes defensively in the stuff I've been able to see. Um, Like there's pieces there, man. Uh, It's just, now it's just got to do it. Everybody's heard about the pieces for the last yeah, seven time. years. It's, it's, I mean, you got to figure some stuff out. And, and uh, producer John notes of all the teams that you named Brooklyn. Uh, oh, Brooklyn, Pist- yes. yeah, yeah, because they're in a the Cooper flag sweepstakes. Yes, they are. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't capture I, the flag. I don't know if Brooklyn will uh, be fertile ground enough for Cooper flag to go there. I and think so. New Brooklyn. I think you're missing what I'm saying, James. You will figure it. You will figure it out after the show because I'm going to tell you after the show, but I'm not going to tell you on wax. Now, okay. <laughs> last thing, Jalen Duran, Jay Ivey, you just mentioned them. Evaluation mm-hmm. year for them, or are you gauging the market? And secondarily, you can pick on both of these or one of these. K. Cunningham is he an All Star player or an All Star talent? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm for sure gauging the interests of ivy and duran just simply because i think that's good business yes like neither one to this point has shown you enough to give them lengthy contracts beyond this season when they're they're extension eligible eligible, extension eligible um but it looks like from what i've been able to see that Jaden might be having you second guess if this stuff and i'm not expecting him to shoot 53 percent from three and 70 percent from the field during the regular season but if you have the condensed version of that then you ask yourself some questions, right? JD, um, all the talent in the world, very smart player, just defensively just has to figure it out. And I've, I've seen that he's he's done some good stuff. I think he did last night against the Warriors, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I didn't yeah. watch the whole game. I saw clips and stuff. But you definitely just have to do good business and figure that out, right? Um, and they are de- they're pretty deep at center. Like Paul Reed's their third center, which he's overqualified to be the third center at, on – the Detroit Pistons, right? But he's not as good as Duran and Stewart. So yeah, I, I think you have to just technically like just do your due diligence and gauge the interest. But I wouldn't be afraid to sign one of them if what they've shown is real. Um, and then I think Kate Cunningham is an all-star player. 
His numbers were identical to Paolo Bancaro's last year in a much worse situation. They were, you look at their numbers, they were identical. And Paolo made the all-star team. Cade now has spacing. It's kind of like Brunson. Like, I know a lot of people compare Cade to Luca. I think I see more Jalen in his game. Uh, I, I see I see if there's if if it's possible. And I think we said this before. His and his sort of spirit animal should be Shea Gilgis Alexander. Right. Cause I think because he's bigger than Jalen Brunson. Yes. He's taller than Jalen Brunson, but he's not as big as Jalen Brunson. Jalen is big and stocky, so that allows him to play, you know, da- you know, that allows small, him to yeah, play in small a small and space. compact. Like, yeah, it's that's Shea, no man wins. Shea yeah. is long and lanky and not exceptionally quick, but he winds up getting to the spots that he needs to get to. Cade isn't necessarily going to blow by you athletically because if he did, he'd be Grand Hill and we'd be having a completely different discussion here. So I just think Shea Gilders Alexander, which is not a put down. Shea Gilders Alexander is a top three MVP candidate this year for a team that we think is going to be the best team in the NBA. Yeah, I'm with you. I I mean, listen, I I think Cade is a very, 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 very talented player. And I think that what he showed last year and that's the fact that he was able to improve off of the leg injury and in that situation last year says it's kind of told me all i needed to know about what he can be and the fact that he just now in year four god i'm getting old in year four Mm -hmm. um has a roster around him that is conducive to his strengths like i think i think we see i think i'm gonna that's i think Cade makes an all-star team this year i mean look last year look the numbers from last year 22 or th- almost 23, 22.7, seven and a half assists, four rebounds on the 45% from the field, 36 from three, 87 from the line. I would expect, if nothing else, the efficiency mm-hmm. to get better. Any, you know, I, I would expect that. I wouldn't expect the scoring necessarily to go up. It doesn't have to no. because of some of the guys, like you have Tobias Harris who's going to take up, you know, some scoring. You're, you're going to have Jaden Ivey, assuming he's the starter who's going to take up some of that usage. Malik's going to get his shots up. Yeah, all, all, the vet, if nothing else, the vets going to get their shots up. Like, yeah. if nothing else, you know the vets, they ain't showing up to just be wallflowers. They showing up because it's an opportunity there. So I'm curious for a number of different things. I like J.B. Bickerstaff. I like the demeanor of Trajan Langdon and the clarity and how he, you know, discusses things. Uh, the franchise has always had a little one voice too many. I'm very curious to see how that plays itself out throughout the regular season when you go through a slump and you start hearing trade rumors and stuff like that. I'm going to be very curious to see how that initially plays out. But 